If you dig deep enough and wide enough, you'll eventually find a tunnel. It's dry and beneath the ocean, so you'll have to take a submarine and all the appropriate gear for underwater excavation and spelunking, making sure the entrance's breach doesn't simultaneously drown the whole tube. The tunnel beneath the ocean is about four feet in diameter and goes nearly straight down, just enough to barely guide the small of your back as the rough, painful edges of earth slowly begin to smooth out. Along with the more tolerable descent comes a slow but consistent shift in direction, but at these speeds even the slightest change in vertical degrees presses your body aggressively flat against the tunnel's floor. It's pitch black and your only frame of reference is gravity's pull and an innate trust in your inner ear's vestibular system, telling you you're now sliding perpendicular to what seemed like the ground only minutes ago at the entrance. The curve of the tunnel doesn't stay flat for long. Suddenly you feel as if your feet are higher than your head and you wonder if you're ascending. Of course, you only have so long before gravity will start to work against your ascent. Want to pull you back down to the lowermost part of the tunnel? You'll slide back and forth like a marble dropped from the edge of a bowl until you're resting miles below sea level. The walls are too smooth at this point, there's no way you could climb back up and out. You're doomed to die in darkness, alone. As quickly as these thoughts arise, they vanish in the blink of an eye, for now you feel as though you're falling again. No, the direction of the tunnel hasn't changed. You're still zooming up, feet rising higher and higher above your head. It's almost as if gravity reversed. The moment your brain catches up, the curve of the tunnel ceases, your body leaves the floor, and you're free falling. Your arms spread in a four-foot panic, only to be met with a fiery friction from the once again roughed, calloused edges of the shaft. The fall continues, and continues, and continues. The panic subsides and reverts to curiosity. At this rate, you must be much higher than the depths of the tunnel's entrance, falling up, back through the ocean and into the air, Wondering what this hole in the sea turned terranean passage in the sky looks like from the outside. Clumps of soil, rocks, seaweed, and sand, fashioned in a cylinder, jutting out of the Pacific, erect towards the heavens. A medium-sized tree trunk to infinity up close, a thin stick stretching from water to clouds from afar. Confounded, you look down and see a dark blue speck. The speck begins to grow as small dots of white light creep into the colored circle. It's the tunnel's exit, and you're approaching at a deadly speed. Before you know it, you're spat out into a vast expanse of space, shimmering stars, colorful planets, rich galaxies, and a small, warm sun burning in the distance begging for attention. Gravity has lost its pull, yet you find it easy to breathe. You look up and the tunnel is gone. You check your peripherals and see a thin, connected stream of giant rocks no more than half a mile away circling you. They're moving up slowly and you realize the entire scene around you is as well. Either you're making a sluggish descent or the universe is bending to you. The lack of gravity is making it hard to tell. You look down again and see a square far below getting nearer. As it approaches, it catches the sunlight and shines a brushed matte aluminum gleam in your eyes and you squint. The size of the silver square proves evident the closer it gets, stretching 187 yards from corner to corner. A thin black line appears in the center of the square, running vertically from your point of view, becoming thicker as the seconds pass. This is not a flat square but a cube, and the top is opening slowly, ready to swallow you whole. You're not scared, you're mesmerized, accepting the situation for what it is, eagerly awaiting your entry to the cube. As you move past the open gates once again into darkness, your gaze tilts upward and the ceiling begins to close. You catch one last glimpse of the celestial realm, eyes locked on a star pulsing twice as if to say goodbye. You blink, and when your eyes open you're sitting in a red velvet cushioned chair, hands draped comfortably over the ends of the armrests. You're in the middle of a massive theater, high ceiling of dark milky jade stretched evenly to four distinct corners, then running down at equal lengths to a floor filled with rows of identical seats, sloping from the back to the front of the room, seating hundreds of thousands of onlookers, gazing in a trance at the scene before them. Where a wall should be, you see a man live out his life. It's not on a screen, as there's no source of projection from in front or behind. It's not through a window, as the view of what's being displayed is changing angles and perspectives masterfully, as if by some divine direction. It's not theatrical or like some sort of film, 
as you get the sinking feeling that what you're witnessing is happening in real time. Real time. Real time. It's real time, yet you feel no sense of it here. The scenes before you of life, death, hope, denial, strength, weakness, blood, water, confusion, pain, anguish, comedy, tragedy, spirit, earth, mountains, deserts, oceans, forests, and plains play out in eerie detail as time seems to inch and speed by in unison. There's a through line to it all. Fragments of a life that when pieced together reveal something that you're too close up to to really understand, comprehend, or see in full display. You laugh with him, cry with him, hurt for him, burn with him. You're close enough to touch him, but far enough for him to never hear you. You learn his name is Mooney, and know it's your name too. The tunnel beneath the ocean is about four feet in diameter and goes nearly straight down. 